Welcome to the Trending Tokens podcast with Jake Vale and Jeff Pulfer. Jake is the CMO of Tokens and Transactive Energy for Centura, an independent power provider using blockchain to revolutionize the energy markets and consults in the security token space. Jeff Pulver is an internet pioneer known for his work in VOIP, has invested in more than 400 blockchain startups, and shares his knowledge through a program called The Pulver Edge and The Almost Daily Jeff, a motivational podcast for entrepreneurs. Today we had a quick show to recap 2019 and provide a little insight into where we think the digital security space is heading. All opinions on trending tokens are the opinions of Jeff, Jake, and the guests. Nothing should be taken as legal or trading advice. The content of this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. I actually have a few clients. I don't have as many as I hope to have. And I'm working with a few startups and helping them you know, avoid some of the things that I made mistakes with and try to share knowledge where applicable. And it's fun. And I just love the engagement and knowing that there are people that hear these things and it resonates with them. And that's, that's, that's worth my time just to do that. That's awesome. Are any of them blockchain companies? On the Pulver Edge? Uh, on the Pulver Edge, yeah. Well, one, of, um, one of my clients is a blockchain company, and another one is exploring the, ni- the non-hype reason to add blockchain to what they do. They're in the real estate space. And, and so there are a lot of hypish reasons why to do it, and we were avoiding that. And after the, first, the next build of their platform is out, you know, they'll consider us using blockchain just as an a authoritative uh, source of that, this, that these transactions happen. But... You know, it's, it's sort of trying to filter. I'm trying to filter out blockchain for blockchain sakes. It's like the people who had .com to the company names just to be cool in the 90s um, versus the value of actually building businesses that are on the internet with, and, and getting internet effect. I, I am completely and totally uh, a true believer that the future of information technology has changed forever because of blockchain. That ever since computers entered the workforce, Going back, let's say, to the 40s and 50s, up through to yesterday, when people, Fortune 50 companies, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies, they built their infrastructure a certain way, but trust couldn't necessarily be relied on. Being able to rethink corporate IT based on trust and immutable trust, that our records can actually be relied upon, that we can have ecosystems between uh, in a supply chain where different vendors, different companies contribute to it. In my, in, my, in my line of business, whatever business that is, it's a game changer. And as revolutionary as the thought of the, the, the Y2K bug was and the way it brought back to life some COBOL code and brought back Fortran programmers and brought people back into the workforce that had retired because they were worried about what's going to happen when everything goes to the year 2000. I think in the 2020s, People for the first time in many, many years can actually rethink corporate IT. And I think where blockchain plays a pivotal role is being able to build out corporate infrastructure of the future. And that, you know, if you can assemble a group of chief information officers, people that are are paid to, I won't say worry about the future, but plan for the future and think about next generation and next, next generation infrastructure for corporations, there's parts of blockchain that should be used and deployed. And, that excites me, I, I, and, I, and, I, and I think that that's not hype, that's just truth. That's, you know, being able to build systems on trust is hard, right? I mean, it's one thing for the underlying protocol of TCP IP to be open, which unfortunately leads to hacking. And a lot of the, lot of the break-ins that we, can, that we see are basically people who are, are exploiting TCP IP um, bugs uh, because those protocols in the 60s and 70s were built on trust. And, and we ha- had the founding fathers of the internet worried about trust, they might have done things differently. And what we can do today with blockchain is we can actually, for practical purposes, trust the underlying data sources. If we sign it a certain way, as long as we, tr- we, we trust the keys, as long as we trust the underlying ecosystem, right? There's, there are fallacies in what I just said. There are ways to break trust. There are ways to hack trust. But... On the positive side of things, I think that there is some great things and a lot of work and a lot of opportunity and big, big, big business ahead. And that, you know, projects that we saw over the last few years to try to make a point or about, or about creating a distributed app on someone's uh, ecosystem, you know, that was tactical, not strategic. The people were trying to create value to really almost hack value to show what was possible. And if you think about the whole ecosystem for mobile phones, you know, I was around the people at Ericsson when they were pushing WAP 1.0. 
this is back in the day, this is like late 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002. I was in the research labs up in uh, Scandinavia. I believe I was in uh, Norway, Oslo, as well as I visited the folks in Stockholm. And, and I told them, when they showed me WAP 1.0 and how you needed to hit a key nine times in order to hit enter. I more or less said to these people, you gotta be kidding me, no one's gonna use this. And, and they were so excited to showcase what they were able to create with the mobile web back then. And I was the one, I didn't mean to pour water on them, but it's like, this is not usable. This is just, not the, there was no user experience. There was no usability, but with vision, you could see that in the future, there could be a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar ecosystem for creating applications that utilize mobility a lot, a lot that will change the way we do business. And it wasn't just about commerce. It wasn't just about, and people will talk about e-commerce. My, my, my contention is that after 25 years, drop the E, it's all about commerce. And that, and, and that there is a future in mobility, right? A future in app building apps is a future in all of that, but we start someplace and then we grow from it. And so it's one thing to showcase WAP 1.0 and the possibilities of what could be. And these days, you know, people cannot imagine a world without uh, mobile apps. And, and I think similarly, as we look at how blockchain gets um, distributed in terms of being core components of future businesses, uh, it will be prolific in how it affected and changed business forever in a good way. Uh, just to do a demonstrate a proof of concept, yes, those projects are needed to prove and to showcase what the future will be. It's like what, while we have world's fairs, while we demonstrate vision, we do proof of concepts, but the, the real heavy lifting still has to happen. Oh, there's so much opportunity out there in terms of building the future, even in finance, even in distributed finance, you know, as, as governments start to pick up and try to understand the impact of ecosystems that now can be rethought of if they're ready to accept that change, th that change will affect many, many things. But, but blockchain is not just about finance. In my mind, it's a big IT play. Maybe the biggest IT play there has been to date. And being able to rethink how we built our applications and rethink and re-explore things that we thought were one way and turn out to be have difference to them now, game changer. So I'm very, very, very long on the impact of blockchain to business, particularly in corporate worlds where we have to trust, where we couldn't before. And then being able to start creating ecosystems where trust is built into it is a game changer. And may require new minds. It may require people who don't know what it means that you can't trust. <laughs> it may require people who were not affected by the, the, the break, by, you know, by, by not being able to trust. So maybe a new generation that does this, but that future is unbounded. On the security token side, do you think that we're in uh, 1.0 or you think we're moving into 2.0? I think looking back, we were, we were in 0.10. <laughs> We were like, in, if, if, or if in my, in my way of doing things, if, if, if 0.0, .0 is the very beginning and you do builds of like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 to get to 1.0, at least that's what I used to do when we're doing, you know, uh, builds and you had alpha, then beta. So Google messed it all up because according to Google, I think, uh, um, I, I think the web browser is still in beta. Everything is in beta. Gmail is still in beta. So it, it kind of like defined, defies me in terms of what, where we are with usability, but you know, if if, if ninety um, ninety uh, if two thousand seventeen and eighteen was a one dot um, we're still there in terms of the general public understanding what this means. I think we actually haven't even gotten to one because of all the education that needs to happen outside of finance within the fintech world. We are moving. We probably moved to version three already. Um, but, but in terms of the actual mass market adoption, we're nowhere near with the potential, right? I, I do, I think every, anyone who works on Wall Street, if they're in the area of finance uh, and deal with uh, stocks, they've seen the volume over the last 20 years for the pink sheets dropping dramatically. Some things trade, but many things don't, and it's very archaic in how, in how things trade. And to say that security tokens replace pink sheets is statingly obvious. But we haven't yet replaced that ecosystem. There hasn't been a complete replacement overhaul. 
So we have coexistence. We, we have the old systems, the new systems. The volumes are not there yet. Is, I don't know if that's because there are not enough customers, not enough trust, not enough people educated on the, who, touch, who deal with the actual customer accounts who can affect that change. But it's slowing down. I believed, you know, to me, 2017, 2018 wasn't hype. I thought that was a reality. Maybe because I was around too many people who also believed that it could accelerate. And it, and it does replace things. It just takes time to, you know, it turns out when you are changing the world and you're working with regulatory regimes, they need to get educated too. And it may be that a lot of people who are today in business may retire first, and it may be their replacements who deploy these newfangled technologies. Uh, I ran into people last year and the year before that I, that I knew from when I worked on Wall Street in the 90s. And some of these people are old enough to retire. In fact, some of them have retired and they're coming back as consultants. And they more or less hinted to me that they know what they know and they don't want to take chances with new stuff. They, they want to st stick with what they know and they'll let the next generation figure out what's going to happen. And so I never heard that, you know, in 2018. No one told that to me, even though that might be just a reality of, of, of change. And so... Um, where are we really? I think in our thinking, we're ahead of the game. Uh, I, I think that people have actually started to think through compliance. People have started to think through uh, how does a company issue a, div, a digital dividend? How does a company deal with a change of how business happens? But that change it may be lightning fast from a technology perspective, but talking about change agents, talking about you know, something that changes the habits of others, you know, the, the threat of the success of security tokens is changing Wall Street. There's no, there's no doubt there. And the total dollar value of where security tokens ultimately will represent globally is in the trillions, I think, if it represents all assets in the quadrillions. I mean, it's some ridiculously large number if, if we just think about absolute replacement and trading volumes and, and stuff like that. But in practical terms, we're still at the, the starting gate. You know, we've, companies have come and gone, businesses have come and gone, but the best businesses have not been built yet. I, I think that there's lots of opportunity for people to take what has been learned and grow that. Now, of course, those companies with a staying power who figure stuff out, they are most likely to succeed because they've had, they paid for their education. They've They've seen what worked, what didn't work, and they're able to morph themselves into the future. And they will be the, the guidepost, the light rail, the, 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 the path to that future. And I, I believe that. And so in terms of where the market is, the market potential is still great. The speed and the timing that the market grows, I, I believe needs to be extended out because there's nothing really pushing and it's not like the government says by 2023, all securities must be digitized or by 2025, we need to do this. Like there's no certain mandates that I have seen anyway, where we're being pushed top down, bottom up, that we have to change. So we have to accelerate a shift. But if we look at, if we look at the market and, 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 and better yet, customers start to understand the benefits of being digital, then there will be an acceleration. And until that time, it's going to go slow. But it's encouraging to see that, that's, that there are companies that are now offering the ability to buy and sell digital assets, that the, the leading company and their competitors are starting to grow, that it's not just a U.S. thing, that over time, it is inevitable that this will happen. It just, you know, I cannot... I thought by 2023 it was going to change. Everything was going to change. I, I think people living, going to business school right now, going into finance, people that are looking to figure out what they want to do for the next 20 years of their lives, if they're in business school or 10 years, this is exciting for a lot of people in finance, and it's it's going to be an exciting run. I I, I think it's going to take much more time, yeah, a I generational shift. There was a big disservice done, I think, early on with the security tokens that most of the companies that were thinking about conducting a security token offering were coming out of the ICO space. So oh, it was a blockchain I, 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 idea. And right. Then, yeah. So you have this combination of we want to solve some kind of unique problem, but we're blockchain ourselves. And, you know, there's like T-Zero might be the only one that I can think of. 
that was raising for a blockchain idea that made sense, you know, that could support the rest of these ideas. And a lot of the deals that I'm seeing now come around are sort of, you know, there's rare earth mineral deals and all kinds of, you know. These are real things. I, I had a great conversation at a recent breakfast about the use of blockchain and supply for the, for the Aggie food chain and for, for, for basically going from farm to table, literally, uh, with being able to, to, to verify and validate that, that this is the food that was grown in that person's farm. When I was at a recent conference uh, late last year in Panama, and I, I met with uh, people who have represent farmers, in, uh, farmer, uh, growers of uh, coffee beans in Panama, and I did not know that in San Francisco, which is behind me, um, at least virtually, that, uh, that there was a, that last year there was a $1,200 cup of coffee served. And it, just like fine wines, there actually are fine, um, fine coffee beans. And there's a whole ecosystem of being able to identify the grower, identify the farms, and using blockchain to verify, validate that, yes, this, this coffee bean came from your farm and that you are a world-renowned grower and you have such a great reputation. And, and when I was actually talking to the people from Guatemala who – who actually know these farmers, they're in the early, early, early stages of being able to, um, to do that. They're actually right now focused on microfinance to be able to help the farmers finance a crop. But the idea of what's happening is great. And I, and I agree that we saw too many people uh, using words without understanding the meaning. Uh, and now we're actually seeing real projects, uh, mostly, you know, mostly outside the U.S., but, but, but they, they are interesting to me. There's, you know, if you happen to be out in the South Pacific on a, on a military vessel and one of your parts broke and you can't get um, a replacement, being able to use a 3D printer with permission from the manufacturer and to have on-demand printing of your of replacement parts for parts inventory and using the blockchain to verify, validate that this is the right model, this is the absolute up-to-date plans, and you have the, the, the permission from the manufacturer to self-manufacture for, for emergencies is an amazing idea. And we're seeing projects like that starting to come through where people are thinking through what does it mean to use 3D printing with blockchain in a work environment on the supply chain side. And, and, and these are not just science fiction stories, this is real life. And so those projects are coming to, to being there will be uh, the so-called unicorns. I mean, assuming that past uh, WeWork and all these post, you know, post uh, 2019, all those companies that came out with huge valuations, which didn't survive their huge valuations, but the idea that a company with a great idea can survive, that will continue to happen. They're already valued before they hit the market, but the security token offerings that have closed, they're just whatever the token was sold at. And as soon as the trading starts, you know, if you have weak volume, if you have weak number it of goes, users. It's close to supply and demand, right? Right. So the, I think that you, the way you that may, they're you, you may think that, you know, this piece of paper is worth uh, $17, but guess what? If the best bid for it is 50 cents, I'm willing to, if I say, oh, you know what? I'm not getting $17. I'll take the 50 cents and run. So you have the, the, the real world market supply. So people could have speculated thinking that this is where it's going to be. But when you come to market, and particularly if you're waiting for a long time for liquidity, those are just real life factors that we don't talk about, even think about that in the practical sense. And when it hits the market, it hits the market. The, the, the one thing which I was trying to uh, share with companies in, you know, two years ago was that in the 90s, from what I remember, Many of the first, I don't know, the first 10, the first 20, but the first number of dot-com offerings, everybody in the food chain made money. That is to say the company that went public and everybody up and down that food chain from the bankers who brought them out to this and that, they left money on the table so profits were shared. And if people get greedy and people price things incorrectly and they don't have market support, because you know, it's one thing to go out with a traditional IPO and have the support of a major bank, you know, major, major people who will keep your price. Right now, as far as I could tell, many of the security token offerings don't have support. So you go out to the market and if they're not buyers for the sellers, the price goes down and, and there may be zero trading volume. Now, what are you going to do? Well, the day that you start seeing volume, you might have to sell or you might hold. And this is all based on the quality of the offerings. And so 
as you were saying with WeWork, you know, people, you know, there, there, there's a mythology and then there's reality and somewhere in between is where, where we are. And so I think as a framework, security tokens offer great value potential, a great way to transfer value, a great way to be part of the future economy. Uh, I, I actually think that we are in a point in time when we can redefine money, that the, the true future of money hasn't been defined yet that we're able to transfer value in ways today and tomorrow that we never could do yesterday. That the advent of uh, digital, of, of, of fuel, of, 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 call it money, money that's programmable to do things based on certain conditions is pretty cool. And, and it's beyond any type of sci-fi book I ever read. And so people's minds need to expand into the possibilities and the, and the issues and the challenges associated with ecosystems that are dynamic. What does that mean? But imagine that your government, that you have a, a small government, large government, and you have to deal with food stamps, that you have people who you want to pay, you want to transfer value to people so they, they could buy food, but you don't want them to buy alcohol or cigarettes. Um, so, but the person who, who, you, who receives the food stamps on the other side, they should have the, the ability to transfer that to buy anything they want to. So being able to have a closed ecosystem where you could transfer value to, to a token and that token has certain characteristics when it's in that person's hands, but when it transfers over to someone else's hands, it has a different characteristic, that, that solves a problem. That mean, at the same time, creates a lot of challenges for compliance. Uh, but we can do these things. We can create ecosystems, sub-ecosystems that support um, different parts of public, public service we, we can do so many things today that yesterday was really like, what are you talking about? And so that will all work within a framework. Then you have all the other stuff, some of the things you're referring to before about this, the offerings, right? So you have, of course, the, the crowdfunding as an option to raise capital. You have Reg D, you have Reg S, you have the Reg A, Reg A plus, and, and how some companies are going about creating uh, value for their shareholders. Uh, creating value for their companies and creating a way to transfer value within the shareholder customer, um, you know, holding, holding uh, base. And those things have still not been solved. You know, even if we theoretically can raise money and we understand the rules for that, there's going to be a what if this or what if that. So that still hasn't happened. Uh, you know, for a large part, many lawyers in America and those who give advice to companies doing business in America refer back to laws on the books in the U.S. government from 1934, right? Uh, you have 33, 34, 1940. You go back many, many years. I, I'm pretty sure that the Digital Securities Act of 2020 isn't happening. I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's a 2021 thing. I don't know if it's a 2025 thing. But sometime in our lifetime, I like to believe that maybe once and for all, we can rewrite the laws in, in Washington, D.C. to be proactive, not reactive, have a vision, understand we'll never get the exact, we'll never get the future correct, but we'll have a chance to look back and at least not be cor corrosive to those who took chances, and that we find a way to embrace innovation and change such that we have a chance to get it right eventually. That would be nice. I mean, it's, it's those people who have to read tea leaves to give advice to clients. It's very hard. And, and, and people who are very conservative, who will not take any risks, that's one reason why they're staying on the sidelines, because they don't want to be at risk for making mistakes. And I understand that completely. And I, I never would, it's like, do no harm. It's a Hippocratic oath, right? You never want to put anyone in harm's way. You don't want to put yourself in harm's way. You don't want to put a client in harm's way. So for th people who don't have questions answered, better to be on the sidelines than, 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 than take risks. So I get that. So... So for me, we're not at version 2.0 yet. Version 1.0 has launched of security tokens. And we're going to have a long runway between the two. Uh, lessons will continue to be learned. Opportunities will come and go, but grow. And those who get educated and those who learn how to do knowledge transfer and those who understand what's at risk are best positioned to be part of that future. One of the biggest problems with the companies that were doing security token offerings that had to do with the blockchain idea, not everyone understands the blockchain. So you're not just looking I, for I, an, I, an I, investor, not just an accredited investor, but you need an accredited investor who understands blockchain. And yes. so getting those value propositions 
sort of, I mean, with real estate, it's much easier. You know, you have an idea of what a building is worth or what a house is worth or whatever the, you know, the, the assets being tokenized. And I think that um, people have shied away from things because, you know, the ICO space made everyone skittish. You know, they, didn't, they don't want to jump into something just because it sounds like it might be a good idea. And then the research, the due diligence you would do before investing, you don't have a lot of information. You're looking at LinkedIn profiles of team members. Have they done anything in the past? Do they have any like subpoenas from the grand jury? Like, you know, it's, it's hard to tell if a project is, even if you have all the information in front of you, it's still hard to evaluate the project. Look, if, if, if the project is in your sector and you understand and feel comfortable with it, you know, people, people make, take chances and, and they're, they're, everyone has their own risk profile. Um, I, I hope that those people that are making investments understand what's going on and they're, they're getting the proper advice because you and I on this podcast and others, we don't provide any type of advice to anybody. We're not broker dealers. We're not advisors. We're not suggesting for people to go to one deal or to the other, but to really to, to know what they're doing, to, to you know, ignorance of, of what they're doing is not a reason to invest. Um, I personally happen to be someone who's invested in the last 20 Three years, twenty last twenty three years, I've been fortunate to invest and grateful for the opportunity to invest in over four hundred startups. I did that on my own. I sought out the opportunities. Very few times did people pitch me. Most of the time, I ran into people at conferences I was hosting. I said, "Wow, Jake, you're awesome. I want to be part of your next startup." And every once in a while, someone named Jake would let me invest when they did their startup. Um, but I was proactive. I wasn't being solicited. I was just doing it. And there are a few times I started companies myself, which um, I just invested in. And so it, it works. But for people who don't know what's happening, who are just playing on the hype, that doesn't work. You know, in the, the mid to late 90s during the voice over IP craze, you know, there were some companies that I accused of selling silicon snake oil. I don't know what silicon snake oil is like in the day of blockchain, but that just shows you my age. Uh, that said, be careful about what happens and you know my hope is people don't fall through those traps uh and you know if they do they'll learn you know but but then again hopefully there are better deals out there and and you know, if you find people to believe in believe in them you know it's blockchain no blockchain it's the merits of the people it's the team it's it's what their offering is it's who they are what they are as you were alluding to you know companies some companies were just running to um, for their own gold rush. People were, were sort of like 1849 all over again, where they're going for the gold. Yeah, and even the kind of, good, even ICOs that seemed like they were good, none of them have executed. You know, there's well, no one. Again, remember during the, you know, I think it was, um, which gene, Levi's? Uh, what, a gene company, I think Levi's jeans basically came out in the gold rush. The people who made the most money in the gold rush were the suppliers, the buckets and the picks. Yeah, they're, they're the ones who won. And, and so in any type of gold rush, symbolically in San Francisco, um, we, you know, people go west and they look to make their mark. And then sometimes businesses will happen and grow and flourish. And maybe the, the, the best for them was yet to come. And, and, and I think that if you take a long term vision, this is a future which is inevitable. Some of the underlying technology for, for security tokens will, will be part of every business, even if they don't know it. As much as today people use voice and they don't know it because they don't have to know it because it's part of the infrastructure of their life. And when they pick up a call you know, on their phone, to an application to click on someone's face to call them, they're using technology that's been evolving for 25 plus years. Or even when they use their landline to place a phone call, the call is transferred using this technology behind the scenes. Same way that blockchain will be deployed, most of the blockchain applications, most of the, some of the most spectacular innovations in blockchain will never be seen by anybody. They'll just be used by everyone. And so when we're looking at the future, we have to understand that not everything's going to be consumer facing. There'll be so many things that are built business to business, business to business to business. So you have, you've seen business to consumer, consumer to business, business to business. But I actually think what you'll see with blockchain is B2B to B business to business to business. And that's sort of, uh, you know, the, the fund of funds idea. You know, let, yes. a fund, let a blockchain fund go out and find the good blockchain projects, let them evaluate it, and you trust your fund to go out and find those things. And another right. model that I've been seeing a lot is um, with the registration crowdfunding and re uh, regulation A+, um, the companies that are doing those right now 
are all expecting to, at some point, tokenize. They might not be doing a security token offering currently, and they're, you know, the shares of their companies might not be a digital security currently, but once they've finished these initial raises, got through that initial you know, year of showing that you can execute, then there's a lot more candidates that are in line waiting for a national security token exchange or a national digital security exchange um, than there would have been if we only relied on the uh, quality of a security token offering. So if someone, if someone raises a bunch of money, then it's sort of, that's, that's the use case for it, or that's the, um, that's how they, how they're being evaluated is how much money you raised on your security token offering. And that might mean nothing. It might mean is nothing there a, at all. Is there a certain range you're seeing today in terms of like tw 2019 to 2020, the size of uh, reggae deals right now? Have they grown in size? Uh, well, is there like, a, I know there's sweet, is there a sweet spot that you see that just works? It's interesting. Um, I think it depends on the type of deal. Uh, there's some smaller real estate deals that are in the less than a million range. Um, I think they're listed on open finance now. I haven't looked into them too carefully, but it seems like it's more like there's a couple apartments available or something like that um, versus an entire building like the, uh, the Aspen Lodge um, offering. I think that companies are becoming more realistic about the amount of money that they need. You know, it's not about trying to raise the most money. If you raise a billion dollars and you only need 50 million, you know, that's a disservice to everybody. <laughs> yeah, are people, because I haven't seen, if they raise too much money, are they just redistributing it back to their shareholders? Are they giving it back? I think that a lot of it is, um, marketing driven. So I would imagine that as they approach the number that they were thinking about initially, uh, they, and this, this speaks to the, the crowdfund and the um, reggae and a plus stuff, you know, the first million dollars, if you can't do something with a million dollars, then you're probably not the right person to be running the company, probably not the right company to be raising money. You're not going to solve that problem. Um, no. And I think that the, the, the size of those, so the, the cap for um, a, a crowdfund is $1,070,000. And I think that every company that raises that takes some of that money to use to pay for the reggae and some of the money to prove that they can actually execute. And then the next step is up to $50 million. So I don't think a lot of companies are jumping directly into Reg D, Reg S. Um, I mean, there's, there's tons of private stuff going on. There's always going to be tons of private stuff going on, but something that brings in, you know, a thousand, 2000 new investors, those projects are few and far between. So, but the, the projects that you would deem to be successful based on their ability to raise funds, reach their goals, are, have they only been in real estate or they've also been in other sectors? No, um, I know that there's quite a few mineral and rare earth metal deals that people are shopping around from cobalt to iron to, you know, there's a bunch of that. And I think that those deals aren't interesting to normal people. Um, you know, the, the Unless you're a geologist, I guess if you're a geologist. Exactly, exactly. What you're getting at those part of it is going to be people's perspective on how they approach it. It still requires education. We still have to retrain the people on the far end who have been watching some of this evolve, but don't quite understand how to pitch their clients alternative ways to raise money and what the rules are and, and, and how to do it. Uh, then there's of course the investor pool and what investors are looking for in returns in terms of you know getting, getting um, squeezed or getting this, getting that. So being able to maintain expectations, you know, being able to provide feedback on the project back to the investors, they understand that this is my goal, this is what we raise, this is how we're doing. And to have sense, some sense of reporting because from a regulatory perspective, from what I remember, there's different different types of fundraising have offered minimum. They, they they tell the uh, the people who are raising the funds the minimum requirement for reporting. And so some people, you know, look go down the path. Of what is the least um, amount of reporting? What is the most amount of non-reporting I can go through? But from a community perspective, I would think that, that those projects would have much more credibility if they were open and transparent. If there were willing to share their bank statements, share um, their, you know, share their financials with the, with the members of the community that have their stock. So when someone says, how you doing, they can see how they're doing. I'm not sure what the level of transparency has been on a voluntary basis with companies going through fundraising historically and today. And 
it might be that people don't share because they don't have to share. And then I question myself, well, gee, if I'm gonna invest in a company and there are two companies that I love, both doing some similar things, one is offering total transparency, one is totally opaque, I might go down the transparent route because I wanna see how they're doing. That's not to say that a company that's opaque is doing anything illegal. It's just, it's a matter of how much reporting, how much sharing, how much caring, and are they giving back to those who were there? It's sort of like building a company on everyone else's back and forgetting to say thank you to those people who gave you the funds to get there. You just took it for granted that the money would be there and you build your business and you think by having a good exit or giving dividends once in a while, that's enough. And so it works the first time, but the second time around, those people have a really hard time getting funds, at least from those people that were there to invest um, if, if they don't feel comfortable. So communication, open direct communication between those investing and those executing it matters, regardless of the regulatory reporting requirements, in my humble opinion. I, I think the more transparent people companies can be and the more open they can be and the more connected they can be back to their community offers a, a higher likelihood of success of being able to build that community that will raise the, increase the buzz raise the mark on how others should operate and, and, and in some period of time will hopefully help drive more people into the fold. And I, and I think that's what we're going to see is that over time, as more traditional companies uh, that were listed on one exchange or the other, uh, whether it's New York Stock Exchange or whether it's um, uh, New York Stock Exchange, when we move uh, across the global exchanges to security-based exchanges, and we can in, engage the end, the end users, the actual people who have, who used to have stock in their uh, 401k plans are now basically are now gonna be token holders. And the more engaged that the end users are in this ecosystem, the more high the likelihood that there'll be, vol that there will be volumes. Because um, right now what we're talking about really is the institutional side. It's as much as I like to believe the everyday person cares about this stuff, we, we are not there yet at an education level to teach people about the merits of the future of digital finance. And so those that are aware of this or aren't, have been entrepreneurs that I've spoken to a couple of years ago, who I was just talking about the new way of, you know, they didn't know what Reg A was or Reg A plus was. I told them talk to a good securities attorney and you could learn about these things about crowdfunding that the, uh, the Jobs Act kind of changed the game. And it was like, they were, they never heard of the Jobs Act. So, because they were not, they, 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 their way of raising money was going to friends and family. Their way of raising money was talking to VCs. They never thought that they can have to go on to this internet thing and go and raise money because they had a great project. So it, it's a relearning experience for some, learning experience for others. And then it's just the ability for everyone to execute and hopefully have positive returns for their time.